Hello, poker players. This is T-Sub Radio again. This time, I will talk about preflop game theory tournament strategy when we have large stacks. For the purposes of this lecture, large stack applies when the effective stacks are at least 20 big blinds. The significance of this large stack, small stack dividing line is that we will nearly always be opening or folding when we have an open opportunity or a raise limper opportunity. We never open jam with a large stack. In contrast, our preflop small stack strategy will often include open jamming or jamming over a limper. This will be the subject of a future video. This lecture is based on information I first published in Lectures on, per on Poker Volume 1 with a few significant improvements. This lecture is best understood if you already know the Holy Grail cash game strategy since our large stack tournament strategy is similar, except that the big blind ante creates a larger preflop pot size. You can review this video listed here, or you can read the book. This lecture covers preflop GTO strategy when we have effective stacks of at least 20 big blinds, which I call the large stack region. When we have an open opportunity with a large stack, we will always be opening or folding, and we will be raising or folding with a single limper. When we face an open with a large stack, we will be three betting or folding. The key characteristic of the large stack region is that we will, be, we will rarely be jamming. My goal is to create a baseline strategy that is easy to use at a live poker table. This tournament strategy is only slightly more difficult to use than our cash game strategy. This will be a baseline strategy that we can adjust depending on our poker landscape. I developed the tournament holy grail strategy using the same tools I used for my cash game strategy. All solutions for this lecture are based on the GTO Wizard solver using the 8MAX MTT model. This model is available for free, so you can reproduce my work without a subscription. I selected the chip EV model, all stack sizes with limps for my analysis. More specifically, the open bet size is chosen automatically with a 2.3 big blind open used for uh, 35 uh, big blind stacks and larger, decreasing to 2.0 big blinds for 20 stacks and smaller. I also adjusted the effective stack size from 100 big blinds down to 20 big blinds for this analysis. GTO Wizard uses a big blind ante structure with the blinds removed from the starting stacks before the hand is dealt. Just to remind you, GTO solutions are not necessarily the optimal solutions. They are just the unexploitable solutions. Game theory assumes that everyone plays perfectly throughout the hand, not just pre-flop. And the solutions are adjusted until every player is unexploitable by everyone else. But real players are always exploitable, and sometimes extremely exploitable. Furthermore, chip utility, ICM and tournament bell curve considerations nearly always allow us to play more loosely and more aggressively than a game theory chip EV calculation would recommend. This is a very large factor in tournament poker. We will develop a GTO baseline strategy in this lecture, but we will usually adjust our decision based on several factors which I will describe here. First, game theory solvers don't generally include ICM in their calculations. ICM tries to assign a value to every player's stack, one that depends on the prize pool and the stack sizes of each remaining player. This may be an excellent way to chop a prize pool when everyone agrees to end the tournament, but might not be accurate for assigning the value of our stack when the tournament is still in progress. For example, ICM does not know what the t our table position is, it doesn't know whether the blinds will change and when they will change, and it doesn't know the skill level of each player. Nevertheless, the ICM meme is generally valid, which is a chip won is worth less than a chip lost. What this means in practical terms is that the a GTO neutral chip EV action is actually unprofitable. This implies that we should play more conservatively in a tournament than we would in a cash game. The impact of ICM depends on where we are in a tournament. When we are far from the bubble, it is generally worth a few hundredths of a big blind. 
So we would fold all our near neutral combos. But when we are near the bubble, ICM considerations often require us to fold very strong positive chip EV hands. In some cases, we should fold every hand when we can fold to a cash. ICM is also very important at the final table. The prize pool accelerates drastically, which means that we should often fold large positive chip EV hands. The second major adjustment we need to make uh, to our game theory baseline is due to chip utility. So what is chip utility? Well, the most important aspect of chip utility is the intimidation factor one player has over another due to the fear of busting out of a tournament. A big stack, ha stack has uh, chip utility over a smaller one because the smaller stack risks his tournament, tournament life by playing the hand. Even a smaller stack can have chip utility over a slightly larger stack because of the, the larger stack won't want to be crippled. This intimidation factor means that players tend to play more cautiously when their tournament life can be damaged. It means that our fold equity improves when we are the aggressor, which improves our chip EV. That means that our neutral and slightly negative uh, chip EV combos can become profitable when our aggression is likely to intimidate our opponents. These, this leads to uh, the chip utility meme, a chip one is worth more than a chip lost. This is exactly the opposite to the ICM meme, so they can offset each other, at least to some extent. Chip utility is not a factor that is easily quantified, but I am attempting to do so for a future book. My current conclusion is that chip utility dominates ICM in most situations when we are the aggressor. But ICM can be more important when we are being aggressed and we are near the bubble or at a final table. For example, suppose we are near the bubble on the button with uh, 40 big blinds. Both blinds have about 10 big, big blinds um, and we jam. ICM is not a factor for us, but chip utility is extremely important since the villains are likely to be intimidated in this case. In some cases, however, um, the button can jam with any two cards. Now that's chip utility. On the other hand, Neither villain has any chip utility since they can't intimidate a player who is already in. But they do have to consider ICM, especially if they can fold to a cash. Our final major adjustment to our GTO baseline strategy is to account for the tournament bell curve. To get a complete picture of the tournament bell curve, you can watch my bell curve video. But the general idea is that we want to polarize our tournament results in order to go deep more often. Suppose we are a solid GTO tag player, one with a tournament finish distribution like the blue line here. This represents the distribution of a large number of tournament finishes, each with exactly 1,000 entrants. Our average finish is a respectable 250th out of 1,000, which is the peak of the curve. Our caches include all of those finishes to the left of the dashed line at the 15% finishing mark. Our deep finishes, which earn the most money, are indicated by the blue circle. Suppose we are able to widen the, our tournament bell curve by increasing our tournament variance, which is indicated by the red curve. We can accomplish this by taking more chances. However, we want to do this without shifting the, our average finish very much to the right. When we do this, our caching frequency is improved and our frequency of high finishes also is much better. I call this the concept of polarized results. Sometimes I call it bell curving. We will cash and go deep more often, but we will also bust out um, early more often, um, but busting out in 700th place is no less profitable than busting out in 250th place. So the trade-off is a profitable one. The secret of polarizing our results is to always play our neutral and near neutral combos and to often err on the side of aggression when we have a close decision. We begin by constructing our ranges just as we did for our cash game strategy. For example, this is the GTO Wizard 100 stack model for an under the gun open opportunity. We can see that we open to 2.3 big blinds with a 16.5% range, folding the rest of our combos. We never open limp. We can see that most of these combos are pure strategy opens or folds, 
A few of them have mixed strategy opens or folds, such as Ace-10 offsuit, which is mostly folding, and 10-8 suited, which is mostly opening. We can create a GTO wizard chart like this for every situation and put the values in a chart like this one. We can drive ourselves crazy trying to see all the small patterns in this, but we can see that these ranges are fairly similar for every stack size from a particular position. For example, the cutoff ranges vary from 36.3% to 37.6% with 100 big blind stacks down to 30 big blinds, each with a 2.3% big blind open. This is a pretty small variation. And remember, our holy grail opening strategy is just our baseline strategy. So normally we will be adjusting from our baseline anyway. So it really doesn't matter which of these stack sizes becomes our baseline. But before we make this decision, let's use our CPI technique to convert these ranges into CPI values, like we have done in my previous videos. Our CPI algorithm assigns a value to each combo according to its op opening strength. This is exactly the same CPI algorithm we use for our cash game strategy. First, we assign a power number for each whole card, which is the same as the card's rank, except that the ace is worth 15 points. Next, we double the power number of the high card and add it to the power number of the bottom card. We can consider this our baseline CPI value. Finally, we add points to this baseline value depending on the characteristics of the hand, as listed in this table. For example, we add 8 points if the combo is suited and 4 points if it's a 2-gapper. Let's look at a few examples. Pocket 10s is worth 58 points. We have 20 points for the first 10 and another 10 points for the second 10. And then we add 28 points because it's a pair. 8th Queen offsuit is worth 50 points. That's 30 points for the ace, 12 points for the queen, and another 8 points because it's an AK, ace-king, uh, ace-queen, or uh, king-queen combo. Finally, queen-jack offsuit is worth 41 points. That's 24 points for the queen, 11 points for the jack, and 6 points because it's equivalent to a one-gapper. Please note that a connector is a combo that can, be, can flop up straight four different ways. Since Queen Jack can flop a straight only three ways, it's a one gapper. Now that we have our CPI algorithm, we can convert our open ranges to CPI values and plot them on a graph, like this one. As we suspected when we looked at the range frequencies, our CPI opening values are nearly constant as our stack size decreases, except for the button. So we can approximate these curves with simple straight lines as shown here. We can list these uh, CPI values in a simple table as shown here. But the button open index is a bit more complex. The button index is about 31 points for stacks down to about 50 big blinds, but then increases to about 33 points as we drop to 20 stacks. So our button opening ranges get a bit tighter as the stacks approach 20 big blinds. But our <clears throat> goal is a simple strategy that we can use at a live table. And it's simpler if we use a single value for all stacks above 20 big blinds. So you can use any value you like, but I use a button position index of 33 points. Using 33 points will be about two points too tight for the larger stacks, but that's not really a problem since we would usually play looser anyway from the button in order to uh, widen our bell curve. Now we have created open indexes for each table position. These are identical to the position indexes for each position, shown in green here. When we compare these to the cash game position indexes, which are shown in red, we can see that they are tracking each other quite well. In fact, we could use the cash game position indexes for tournaments if we simply subtracted two or three points from each cash game index. But since we normally prefer to err on the loose side in tournament play, we could simply subtract three points from the cash game values, except for the small blind. So, our large stack holy grail opening strategy is the same as for cash games with slightly looser position indexes due to the larger starting pot in the tournament. And once we have our position indexes, 
our opening net next is equal to our position in next, just as it is for cash games. Our next task is to deal with limping. The arguments for and against limping with large stacks in a tournament are the same as for cash games. I urge you to watch video CL003 to understand this better. Unfortunately, we have very little tournament data to guide us, but we can look at what game theory tells us. First, there is no GTO limping with 30 stacks or greater, except a little bit from the small blind. In fact, there is very little open limping at all with 20 stacks or greater. And these are all mixed strategy uh, options. So our, our holy grail open limping strategy is the same as our cash game limping strategy. We never open limp. There is also no GTO limping from behind with 30 stacks since uh, there is no open limping. And there is very, limping, uh, very little limping behind with 20 stacks. The small amount of limping behind with 20 stacks is nearly always a mixed strategy. So, our holy grail baseline limping strategy is simple. Never limp with a stack larger than about 20 big blinds. However, we might want to occasionally adjust from this baseline. The main reason would be to widen our bell curve with low risk. Folding and limping behind are our only options when we face limpers. We can also raise. GTO solvers don't provide much insight here, however, since there isn't much limping to begin with. But I have no reason to think that our large stack tournament strategy should be much different from our cash game strategy, which is to raise a limper with our open index plus zero to two points, depending on the softness of the game. On the other hand, there are a few important differences. Tournaments often have smaller opens, so raising a limper is often cheaper than it is in a cash game. Yet the pot has more money in it for us to win with a raise. Also, the tournament bell curve and chip utility can tend to induce a somewhat looser and more aggressive attitude. So, we can raise a limper in a tournament with our open index plus zero points when we have effective stacks of 20 big blinds or larger. Perhaps we might want to add a point with two or three limpers. Finally, we add one big blind to our normal opening size for each limper we face, just like we do in a cash game. We will often be facing an open, especially when we are in late position. We can fold, call, or three bet in these situations. Let's tackle three betting first. A fundamental principle for raising is the gap principle, which states that our raising range should be higher than our opponent's opening range. This table shows the gap principle in action. It shows our GTO range after a, uh, a low jack GTO open, which uh, he does with a 21.6% range. Our three betting range from the hijack is only 7.2% or about one third as wide as Mr. Lojack's opening range. We can also see that our three betting range from the cutoff and the button are also about 7.2%, which indicates that our three betting range on Mr., uh, depends on Mr. Lojack's opening range, but not much on our table position. We can repeat this analysis for any open position. The results are shown here. When we convert our 3-bet ranges to 3-bet indexes, we can see the values in the third row. When we subtract our position index from our 3-bet index, we get the 3-bet gap, shown here. It's clear that our 3-bet index is just the position index of Mr. Opener plus a gap of 9 points. In this algorithm, the position index of the opener is indicated by brackets, uh, which I show in green here. This is exactly analogous to our cash game 3-bet index, with a cash game gap of 6 points. But our tournament position indexes are about 3 points lower than our cash game position indexes, so we are actually 3-betting with uh, similar frequencies in cash games and tournaments. It appears that the presence of the antes doesn't matter very much when it comes to our three betting ranges. Finally, I should note that some of our three bets can become jams when the effective stacks drop to about 25 big blinds, and some of them can become flats. These are nearly all mixed strategies, however, so we can simply use our standard three bet algorithm, perhaps with a slightly smaller three bet size, uh, perhaps a two and a half times the open. 
um, we can also uh, run into this problem if the open size is larger than the 2.1 big blind GTO standard. So when the effective stacks get close to 20 big blinds, we may need to use some poker judgment to decide whether to jam 3-bit or flat. But our overall playing range is generally close to our standard 3-bit baseline. You may have noticed in the previous slide that there is a calling range from every position after a low jack open as long as the effective stacks are at least 30 big blinds or so. We can convert our plane ranges into plane indexes as shown here. Our plane index includes hands that we either 3-bet or flat, and our plane range is the same as Mr. Opener's position index when the open comes from the low jack or earlier. So when the open comes from these early positions, we flat with Mr. Opener's position index while we add 9-point gap for 3-betting. Our flatting range gets gradually tighter as the villain opens in later positions. This is because the villain's opening ranges are getting wider. Our flatting ranges uh, after a button open is a special case. Since we will be in the blinds when the button opens, uh, we will be out of position post-flop to his, to his um, open. So we should be more conservative in our flatting range when the button is the opener. So we can approximate our flatting index as Mr. Opener's position index plus one point. This would be slightly tight when the open comes from early position, but that may be a good thing in a real tournament with players that open more tightly than GTO recommends. Remember, this is just our baseline flatting alg algorithm. It puts us in the ballpark for making a solid decision, but we should always consider the poker landscape before we actually act. Our Holy Grail large stack tournament strategy can be summarized on a single page. This is our CPI algorithm, which is the same one we use for cash games. And this is the tournament position index algorithm, which is slightly looser than for cash games. And these are our, our Holy Grail algorithms for large stack tournament play. Remember, large stacks means that we have effective stacks of 20 big blinds or more. First, we open with our position index and raise limpers with our position index plus zero points. Most tournaments are fairly soft, so I generally use zero point gap here, especially when I'm in the hijack or later. We three bet and open with the position index of Mr. Opener plus nine points, but we can flat him with just a one point gap. We rarely limp and rarely limp behind but we should go bell curving based on our neutral and near neutral combos. So we might open a bit wider, occasionally limp on the button after multiple limpers especially, three bet more widely and flat more widely, especially in late position. These large stack algorithms are not much more complex than our cash game algorithms, but our adjustments to our baseline are much more complex since tournaments possess extra factors that we must consider. Let's go through an example. Suppose we are playing in a $20 WSOP.com freeze out and we are not close to the bubble. Two players limp and it's on us in the cutoff with an ace eight offsuit hand. What should we do here? Notice the graphic in the lower right side of this slide. This is just the holy grail summary we saw in the previous slide. We can use this to make our baseline decisions. In this case, our position index is 36 points from the cutoff and the combo power index of our ace eight offsuit is 38 points, which is double the top card power number, which is two times 15, added to the bottom card power number, which is eight. We can summarize this in this box. Our holy grail strategy after limpers is to raise when our CPI is at least as big as our power index plus zero points per limper in a soft tournament. In this case, we are playing in a soft tournament as witnessed by the two limpers. So we can easily raise these limpers since our 38 point hand is better than our position index of 36 points. We could do this even if we used a one point per limper gap. Our normal open here would be about two and a half big blinds, a little bigger than GTO because this is a soft game and I like to raise a little bigger in soft games. So our raise would be to about four and a half big blinds due to the two limpers. Notice that we could also have raised from the hijack, which would require a 38 point hand if we use a zero point gap. That would make it a neutral EV decision, and we want to be aggressive with neutral decisions. 
Notice also that we could have raised from the cutoff with a hand as weak as a6 offsuit, maybe even weaker if we want to go bell curving. Let's try another example. Suppose we are playing in a $215 WSOP.com circuit event. About 30% of the players remain, so the field is enriched, but we are not yet close to the bubble. The low jack player opens to 2.5 big blinds, and it folds to us in the cutoff with ace-9 suited. What should we do here? In this case, the position index of the low jack is 40 points, and the combo power index of our hand is 47 points, which is double the top card power number, which is 2 times 15, plus the bottom card power number, which is 9, plus another 8 points for being suited. We can summarize this in this box. Our holy grail strategy after an opener is to 3-bet when our CPI is at least as big as the villain's power index plus 9 points, which would be 49 points here. I suspect that Mr. Opener is opening a bit tighter than GTO, even though the tournament is enriched. Um, so this is probably not the best time to, get, to go bell curving, at least not aggressively. Our hand is not strong enough to 3-bet, therefore, but is likely strong enough to flat unless our lefties are notably aggressive. So, in the absence of a read on our lefties, I would normally just flat here. Suppose we had ace-10 suited. Now our hand is worth 50 points, which is normally strong enough to 3-bet the hijack opener. But we still might just flat if we believe that Mr. Opener is significantly tighter than GTO. That's the gap principle in action. Versions of this lecture were presented at the Las Vegas Wednesday Poker Discussion Group in 2023 and 2024. You can join us every Wednesday at Tommy Rockers, and you can join our Facebook group to see the agenda for our next meeting. That's all, folks. Our next task is to deal with limping. The arguments for and against limping with large stacks in a tournament are the same as for cash games. I urge you to watch video CL003 to understand this better. Unfortunately, we have very little tournament data to guide us, but we can look at what game theory tells us. First, there is no GTO limping with 30 stacks or greater, except a little bit from the small blind. In fact, there is very little open limping at all with 20 stacks or greater, and these are all mixed strategy uh, options. So our, our holy grail open limping strategy is the same as our cash game limping strategy. We never open limp. There is also no GTO limping from behind with 30 stacks since uh, there is no open limping. And there is very, limping, uh, very little limping behind with 20 stacks. The small amount of limping behind with 20 stacks is nearly always a mixed strategy. So our holy grail baseline limping strategy is simple. Never limp with a stack larger than about 20 big blinds. However, we might want to occasionally adjust from this baseline. The main reason would be to widen our bell curve with low risk 